All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, let's get started here. I uh, wanted to remark before we get started with the course material, I saw some questions about a previous material in the chat. Uh, I uh, will uh, answer such questions uh, for a few minutes at the end of the lecture, but I wanted to get uh, through with the material first. Uh, otherwise, uh, please uh, always feel free to ask on uh, Piazza. All right. So um, we have been discussing about a database uh, design. And uh, more specifically, we have been looking into how we can optimize an initial database design via normalization. And uh, normalization is in particular about getting rid of redundancy. And uh, there is multiple techniques that bring some unoptimized database schema into an optimized uh, form. And uh, we have been uh, discussing a lot about functional dependencies last time because uh, functional dependencies indicate a redundancy that you want to get rid of by normalization. Later, we will discuss about a uh, normal forms, um, which are uh, schemata that have certain nice formal properties. So this is something that we want to achieve. And then we will see normalization algorithms, which is actually, which is essentially the technique by which we get to a normal form schema. All right. So we have been discussing about function dependencies. And as a little reminder, function dependency just means that the values in some set of columns imply the values in some other set of columns. So you write them x implies a y, where x and y are sets of uh, attributes. And uh, the semantics is that if you know the values in x, then you also implicitly know the values in y. And uh, if you have those function dependencies uh, within one single table, it means that you could store redundant uh, information like here, and that has various uh, disadvantages. Uh, the solution is to decompose tables such that function dependencies do not hold within the same table anymore. And here we essentially resolve the redundancy problem. All right. So um, we have discussed about uh, function dependencies and we have discussed that they indicate a uh, redundancy in most uh, cases. One exception is if the function dependency essentially states that knowing the value in key columns implies the values in other columns. In this case, you cannot have redundancy because in your database, you can only store one row uh, with the same values in the key columns. All right. So, at the end of the last lecture, we have uh, started discussing about how we can find function dependencies for a given uh, database uh, schema. Um, what does not work is to try to look at the current data because that only represents the current state. And even if it looks as if you have a function dependency there, it uh, might not generalize. So valid sources for function dependencies is uh, first of all domain knowledge. If you just uh, know from your use case uh, analysis that this function dependency must hold. And uh, based on some initial function dependencies uh, derived based on domain knowledge, you can infer uh, more function dependencies via uh, algorithmic methods. Now, the last time we have uh, in particular discussed about Armstrong's uh, axioms which are a couple of uh, rules that allow you to infer new function dependencies from given ones. And uh, if you apply Armstrong's axioms uh, often enough, then in the end, you end up with the closure for a given set of function dependencies, which is essentially all the function dependencies that can somehow be inferred from the original ones. Now, the problem with those uh, closures is that they are extremely large. So it is typically impractical to try to calculate one of those closures. So now in the following, we're gonna discuss how we can narrow down our scope a little bit and uh, not try to infer all function dependencies, but rather only infer uh, function dependencies that are based on the same attributes on the left-hand side, basically. So this is one way of narrowing down the scope. Um, that leads to attribute uh, closures. Um, an attribute uh, closure essentially 
tells you what are the attributes for which I can infer the values if I know values for this set of uh, attributes. So we typically um, denote that with the plus sign. So if you have some set of attributes uh, x, then x plus is the attribute closure for x, which means those are all the attributes for which you can infer values based on the values in x using the function dependencies that you have. Now, this essentially gives us uh, some uh, subset of function dependencies uh, from the closure. Uh, for instance, you often want to check whether function dependencies which have specific uh, attributes on the left-hand side, whether they can be inferred from given function dependencies. And the way to check on that is by using the attribute closure. Now, how can we calculate the attribute closure for a given set of functional dependencies? The algorithm is fortunately relatively uh, natural. You uh, see it uh, here. And we essentially start uh, with um, the attributes in uh, x, because if I have given values for the attributes in x, then most certainly I can infer the values for the attributes in x from that. Then I keep iterating and I keep adding more attributes whose value I can infer based on the given attribute values. So the way we do this is that we iterate uh, over all function dependencies, which are of the form A implies B. And if my current closure, meaning the set of attributes for which I can infer the value, um, is a subset of uh, the, if it includes the left-hand side of the function dependency, then I add the right-hand side of the function dependency into my closure. So this uh, subset uh, sign should actually be the other way around. So if the um, left-hand side of the function dependency is included within the uh, current closure, then we add the right-hand side to the set of attributes whose values we can infer. Let's make a little example in order to make things uh, more concrete. Um, we ha have given the function dependencies in F here on the top of the slide. And here we want to calculate the attribute closure of the attribute set A and B. E. All right, so this is represented as A, E plus. And uh, in the first iteration, we just uh, start with exactly this set of uh, attributes A and E. So after we um, iterate over the function dependencies, we will expand that set by adding uh, attribute C and D. So let's see how that happens precisely. So during this iteration, we assume that we have given values for attributes A and E. So if we look through the function dependencies, already looking at the first function dependency here, we state essentially, if you know the value for attribute A, you can infer the value for attribute D. And since we know the value for attributes A and E, um, we know the value for A, and we can therefore infer the value for D. Now, going further through the functional dependencies here, um, we see the last one, which essentially states that if you know the value for attribute E, you can infer the value for attribute C. And this is why, since we have given E, we also want to add C to our set of attributes that we can infer. So after this iteration, we know that we can infer the attributes A, C, D, and E, given values for attributes A and E. Now we're gonna iterate over the functional dependencies again, because we have just added attributes into our closure. And uh, that might mean that now more function dependencies become applicable. So if we go through the functional dependencies again, this time uh, considering that we are given attribute values for attributes A, C, D, and E, um, we can uh, see that here we have the function dependency CD 
implies i. So if you know a value for attribute c and the value for attribute d, then you can infer the value in attribute i for the corresponding row. So because of that, we are adding i into the closure as well. All right. And uh, so here we have expanded the uh, attribute closure to a, c, d, e, i. Now, when going again through the function dependencies here, um, a, b implies e, but unfortunately we don't know b. Um, b, i implies uh, e, but we have already e and we don't have b anyway. Um, c, d implies i, all right, so we have that. And uh, e implies c, we have that as well. So here, nothing really changes anymore by the next iteration. And this is how we know that we have converged. And now further iterations would not expand the attribute closure any further. This is why we can stop the algorithm. And now we have calculated the attribute closure. I believe there might have been a question. So um, exactly, yes, very good. So the question is whether uh, this means that uh, knowing values for the attributes A and E, we can infer values for attributes A, C, D, E, and I. That is correct. And here is also the representation of the functional uh, dependency. That is correct. So the um, attribute closure essentially gives you um, additional functional dependencies that can be inferred from the original functional dependencies, yes. So based on what we see here in the attribute closure, um, we know that we have the functional dependency um, A and E implies A, C, D, E, and I, or any subset of that. So the attribute closure generally gives you a subset of the total closure with a specific attributes on the left hand side. So yes, you are correct. Is there any more questions about the attribute closure at this point? All right, then let's say continue. All right, before we uh, go further, uh, first of all, I want to show you that this is actually a pretty efficient uh, algorithm. Um, so here we have uh, the algorithm again, and now we analyze the uh, complexity. Here, for instance, the innermost uh, command uh, nested in those uh, loops here, uh, that one should have a complexity that is proportional at most to the number of attributes, because a B is a set of uh, attributes, a subset of all possible attributes, and adding those uh, attributes to the closure should uh, take a time that is uh, proportional to the number of attributes. And uh, also checking for one specific function dependency, whether its uh, left-hand side is included in the closure, that also is uh, proportional at most to uh, the number of attributes. So this is relatively cheap, but let's see how often we execute that. Um, here we iterate over all function dependencies. So clearly the complexity is proportional to the number of function dependencies. And uh, here finally, we have um, a loop that uh, keeps iterating until a convergence. Um, but we know that for each function dependency in my function dependency set, um, I will only, it will only change the closure uh, once because if it has uh, been uh, triggered, meaning if the left-hand side of the function dependency is known, then we add the right-hand side of the function dependency into our closure. But that can only happen once for each functional dependency. And uh, if we don't have any changes to the closure anymore, then we terminate our iterations. So because of that, I know that the number of iterations is limited by the number of uh, functional dependencies uh, as well. And taking everything together, I know that this algorithm is uh, proportional to the number of uh, attributes and uh, quadratic in the number of functional dependencies at most. And uh, so this is already reasonably cheap. And so just that you know, 
there's also other algorithms that are even a little bit more efficient than that. So the attribute closure can be calculated quite efficiently. One way in which we can exploit the attribute closure is for calculating all keys of a relation. And uh, when discussing about redundancy, uh, we have discussed that function dependencies, they can be good or bad depending on whether they have a key on the left-hand side. So finding keys is generally important in order to assess a redundancy. And uh, this is an algorithm that uh, essentially finds uh, all keys for a given uh, relation. So um, if we simply iterate over all uh, attribute uh, sets of that uh, relation, we can check if it is a key by calculating the uh, attribute uh, closure for that uh, attribute uh, set. And uh, we have a key if uh, the attribute uh, closure includes all attributes in the entire relation, because a uh, key is essentially a special case of function dependency where the left-hand side implies all the attributes in the entire table. And this is what we can check using the attribute closure. So this is one possibility to calculate all uh, keys. As you see, the algorithm is, of course, a more expensive, even though calculating the attribute closure is quite cheap. Here, this one iterates over all uh, attribute uh, sets, and their number is, in general, uh, exponential in the number of uh, attributes per table. So that is, uh, on the other side, quite an expensive algorithm. <clears throat> all right. So. And just the saying, typically, if you are um, trying to get to a normal form, which we will do uh, in a couple of slides, you don't have to calculate um, all the keys in the relation via this uh, method. Typically, there's ways in which you can uh, more easily uh, recognize which function dependencies are okay or not. But in principle, you could apply this one in order to get the full set of all possible keys, and that allows you to check whether function dependencies are okay or not okay. All right, so now we have discussed the functional dependencies. We have discussed a couple of uh, corresponding algorithms uh, which allow you to uh, infer functional dependencies. And next up is our discussion of a normal form. And we say that a schema is in a normal form if in general it had certain desirable properties with regards to redundancy. And we will see some of the most common normal forms, but just so you know, there is more normal forms uh, that uh, are also used in practice. So here we are only going to cover the most important ones. One of those is the Boyce-Cott normal form, short B, C, and F. And in order to verify whether a given schema is in Boyce-Cott normal form, we have to do the following. So here in the following, I assume that you have an overview of which function dependencies hold for that schema, either because of the main knowledge or because they can be inferred um, from initial functional dependencies. And also assume that you can assess whether uh, a function dependency refers to a key or not. All right. So we decide whether a schema is uh, in voice cut normal form by going for each uh, table over all the function dependencies which uh, hold uh, within that uh, table. And uh, for each of those functional dependencies, uh, one of two cases must apply. In those cases is what you have here. A function dependency does not indicate a redundancy. If first of all, it is a trivial function dependency. And a trivial function dependency is something like saying, that um, knowing a value, knowing the name of the customer, and knowing the age of the customer implies the name of the customer. So just saying that knowing the name of the customer implies knowing the name of the customer. So those are trivial functional dependencies. They always hold, and they don't specifically mean that there's any redundancy. So that is definitely OK. Um, on the other side, function dependencies are OK if they represent a key constraint, meaning that the left-hand side implies all the attributes in the entire table. Um, key constraints are okay because uh, for the same values in the key columns, 
I cannot store any uh, two any two rows. So because of that, I know that there won't be any redundancy. And uh, if for each functional dependency on a table, both of one of those two uh, constraints uh, applies, um, and if that uh, holds for all the tables in the uh, database, then the corresponding schema is said to be in Boyce-Cott normal form. So this is very strict about avoiding any redundancy. Okay, and here there is a question I see, whether a B is a set or a single value. Okay, great point. So uh, in this case, um, we assume that we have normalized the function dependencies and uh, put a single value on the right hand side. You can show that you, if you guarantee this for uh, those uh, function dependencies, then it will hold in general. Okay, so very good point uh, picking up on that. Yes, so here we essentially assume that we have a single attribute on the right hand side. Let's make a little example to make things uh, more concrete. Um, we have a schema given on the lower side of the slide, and I have given you the shorter version of the definition of the boyce cut normal form on the upper half of the slide. Here we have uh, three tables uh, in the schema, um, which have different uh, subsets uh, of attributes, and we are given the function dependencies that you see here on the bottom of the slide. Um, does anyone want to um, tell me whether um, whether we might have a boycott uh, normal form here. So let's go through the different uh, tables together. So um, let's start with table number one, which has uh, the functional, uh, the, which has the attributes uh, A and B. Um, does anyone want to make a guess about whether uh, this table um, satisfies the conditions for a boyce cut normal form? Yes, very good. So A implies B is okay because uh, A is a key for this uh, table. So we have uh, one of the two cases that we want. Very good, okay. Let's maybe treat the third table before the second table because the third table has uh, less attributes. It has um, only attributes as C and D. I believe there's a follow-up question in the chat. How do we know if something is a key uh, in this uh, example? Well, the definition of a key is that essentially by knowing the values for those uh, columns, you can infer the values for all columns in the same table. And uh, in this case, for table one, we only have uh, two attributes, which is A and B. And uh, we are given a function dependency, which says A implies a B. And uh, because of that, I mean, this is a function dependency that holds on the attributes of a uh, table one. So we have to decide whether it uh, represents any redundancy or not. But since here A is a key, um, it means that this functional dependency is okay.
So this is implied by the function dependency A implies B. And uh, a key that always relates to one single table. So um, in order to be a key, it only has to imply the attributes that are in the same table. Great question. All right. Anyone has any suggestions about table three? So for table three is actually also, uh, it's quite non-dangerous in a way because here we only have uh, two attributes. So if there's a functional dependency that is uh, non-trivial, then it uh, essentially must be of the type that knowing the value in one of those attributes implies the value in the other attribute. Because, But because we only have two attributes, it means that in that case, it would have to be a key as well. So here, um, there is a no specific uh, functional dependencies. Let me quickly, quickly moving this. So there is no a specific functional dependencies uh, with uh, C here. On the other side, D implies A and uh, E, and uh, um, and. Um, a implies a C, so D implicitly implies a C as well, but um, here that makes it a key, and uh, therefore we don't uh, we don't violate the constraints of Boyce-Cott normal form. And here that was exactly the comment I see here. Yes, exactly. Yes, you're absolutely correct. D is a key here in table three because um, it implies a C. Very good. Okay, so that table is also okay. Now <clears throat> let's finally look uh, at table two. Um, it has uh, attributes A, D, and uh, E. So um, anyone, any suggestions about that? Can anyone spot a key for this table? Okay, D implies uh, A and E, yes, uh, very good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so D is definitely a key. Is there any other keys? Very good, yes, exactly. So over a couple of uh, corners, A also um, implies all the other attributes. You see here, A implies a B and A implies a C and uh, B, C implies D. So A implies a key, which means that it also becomes a key via transitivity. Yes, so A is also a key here, right? So also all function dependencies that have A on the left-hand side uh, should be fine. Uh, all function dependencies that have D on the left-hand side uh, should be fine. And uh, here finally E. Um, there's no real um, function dependencies which have E on the left-hand side. Um, so here it seems that all the function dependencies are okay and uh, therefore this should be in a Boyce-Cott uh, normal form. All right. Yes, exactly. So essentially 
we are checking for all the function dependencies that can be inferred from the original function dependencies. Question was whether a Boyce code normal form considers the entire closure of function dependencies, and yes, that is the case. All right. Now, the second uh, or the third normal form here, but the second one that I'm discussing in this lecture here, um, that is the one that you see here. And um, that is another very commonly used uh, normal form in practice. It is a little bit more permissive compared to Boyce-Cott normal form, because here for each of the function dependencies, we require not one out of two, but only one out of three conditions to be satisfied. And the first two conditions are exactly the ones that we have seen for the boyce cott normal form. So when going over all the function dependencies that hold for a specific a table, we say that they're okay if they're either trivial or if the left-hand side contains a key or if the right-hand side is part of some minimum key for the uh, relation. And the minimal key is generally it's a set of columns uh, which forms a key, but if you take away any of those columns, then you won't have a key anymore. So this is essentially a key without any redundant uh, columns added to it. All right. So again, the process to determine whether a given schema is in certain normal form is to go over all tables. For each table to collect the function dependencies, initial or inferred, doesn't matter, all the function dependencies which uh, apply to the attributes uh, of that table and then to check for each of them whether at least uh, one of those uh, conditions uh, applies. And if that applies for all function dependencies and for all tables, only then is the corresponding schema in a third a normal form. All right. And a minimal key is generally a key uh, which uh, stops being a key if you take away any uh, columns. So you have a set of columns which uh, imply values for all the other columns in the same table. But if you take away any of those columns, then you cannot do that anymore. A key without any superfluous, without any redundant uh, columns. All right. So this assert condition is new compared to Boyce uh, cut normal form. And it uh, allows a certain type of uh, redundancy. So this is a very specific condition here. Of course, so one might wonder why people allow specifically this type uh, of uh, redundancy. And um, before we go into this, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that on the uh, next slide, but uh, let's already make a little example for verifying whether something is in the third normal form. And uh, here we have the same uh, example again. So can anyone tell me whether that is in third normal form? Yes, exactly. Very good. So here the insight is that uh, voice cut normal form is essentially a restriction of third normal form. So if something is in voice cut normal form, it also must be in third normal form because if you compare the conditions, you can I quickly um, do that again. If you compare the three conditions of third normal form and the two conditions of voice cut normal form, the first two are essentially identical. So a third normal form is really just a little bit more permissive compared to boyce cut normal form. All right. So if we compare those uh, normal forms, then I mean, at first one could think that boyce cut normal form must be better because it allows less redundancy. And we have seen that redundancy has quite a few uh, disadvantages. So, um, that is the advantage of voice code normal form that we don't have a redundancy anymore. On the other side, um, it also has a, a disadvantage because we have to break up uh, our dependencies. 
And uh, that means essentially the following. Um, if you have function dependencies, then uh, you often want to verify that freshly inserted data satisfies those functional dependencies. For instance, in our original example, we had a function dependency linking the number of hours worked by TAs to um, the, their salary. And if I would now try to insert a new TA into the database with a salary that is inconsistent with the number of hours worked, then I probably want to um, reject that update. And uh, in order to verify whether that uh, update um, is uh, okay or not, um, in some cases, I might actually have to look at a multiple uh, tables and I might have to join them in order to verify whether a certain functional dependency is, uh, is uh, satisfied. <clears throat> and uh, the drawback of Boyce Scott normal form is essentially that I might have to decompose tables uh, so far that uh, in order to verify some um, relevant functional dependencies, whether they hold for uh, new data, I might have to actually uh, join multiple tables together. And as we know, the joins are expensive um, and therefore um, we might want to allow a little bit of redundancy if it helps us to avoid additional joins. And this is exactly what uh, the third normal form has been designed for, so to speak. Um, it uh, allows us to always preserve uh, dependencies, meaning that I can verify functional dependencies without having to do any joins. And uh, the slight extension of voice code normal form, uh, you can prove, even if we are not gonna do it here in the lecture, um, but you can prove uh, that uh, this allows you to uh, preserve um, all dependencies. If you're interested in this, then please have a look into the book into chapter 15. But this is the reason why we want to slightly relax the requirements of Boyce Cot normal form. All right, so those were already the normal forms that I wanted to uh, introduce here because uh, those are two of the perhaps most uh, popular normal forms I used uh, in practice. Now we're gonna start discussing a little bit about uh, transformation methods and towards the end, I can also take a few questions uh, on uh, some of the uh, prior material. So the algorithms that we discuss here, their goal is essentially to bring some initial database schema into one of those uh, normal forms. And the way to get to some of those normal forms that is generally decomposition, and which is what we have already applied in our very first example, where we first had the TA name, the uh, number of hours worked, and the salary in the same table, which caused problems. So we decomposed it into one table about TAs and the number of hours worked, and a different table, which keeps track of the relationship between the number of hours worked and the associated salary. So the way to reduce redundancy is by decomposing those uh, tables. One very important uh, requirement here is that we want to decompose tables in a way that allows us to reconstruct the original data. We want to avoid redundancy, but of course we don't want to lose any data. And the condition in order for this uh, to hold is the one that you see here. So let's assume I have some uh, relation R, where R is essentially uh, just a set of uh, attributes that the relation has. And now I'm decomposing the set of attributes R into X and Y and introduce uh, essentially tables for storing those attributes in X and another table for storing the attributes in Y. Now X and Y, they might uh, overlap. And if I take the union of them, then I need to go back uh, to R. And I know that my decomposition is okay if uh, I know that intersecting X and Y either implies all the attributes in X or all the attributes in Y. Now, what that means essentially is that uh, if I join together the two tables after decomposition again, and I require that uh, values are equal for those columns which appear in both of the 
decomposed at tables, then uh, if one of those uh, conditions here holds, it means that I can uh, match uh, each row in the table associated with x to exactly one row in the table associated with y or the other way around. So essentially, when intersecting those uh, two uh, column sets, then you need to obtain a key for one or the other of the two decomposed uh, tables. In that case, if I do a natural join between the two decomposed tables, I will get back my original relation, which means that the decomposition is lossless. Now let's see a little example uh, here. So um, here we have a slightly extended example from the one that we have uh, originally seen. So here we have also added the uh, office um, of the uh, TAs. And again, I have this constraint that hours implies the salary. So here, if I um, have decomposed uh, my table into, uh, into those two uh, tables that you see here, you see that there's some overlap between the columns of those two decomposed tables. The hours column appears in uh, both of them. And if I do a natural join between them, what I will get back is this uh, original table that you see over here because the hours implies the salary. And that means that um, for each um, row on the left-hand side, I find exactly one matching row on the right-hand side. So if I do a natural join between them, then I get back my original table. Now on the other side, if I decompose uh, like this, I store the TA name and the number of hours in one table. And in the other table, I store the hours, the salary, and the office of a corresponding TA. Now here, that is a bad decomposition because uh, I cannot really uniquely link rows from those two decomposed relations uh, together again. Because about the, each TA, I will only know uh, how many hours that a TA works, but the connection between the name of a TA and the office um, is unfortunately lost. And if I would do a natural join between those two decomposed tables, then I would not get back the table that you have seen on the uh, previous slide, but instead I would actually get back a larger table, which has lots of spurious, spurious uh, rows. Then essentially combining one TA with the office of another TA, which is working the same hours. So here I would essentially get back at uh, this um, table over here. Now the name can sometimes be uh, confusing. I'm calling it, or in general, it is called a lossy uh, decomposition. What it actually means that if you would try to recompose things again, you would not get back less, but actually more than what you want. But uh, that also means that information about which TA belongs to which office has been lost. And this is why we cannot get back our original data, which is bad. So this is how we want to decompose our tables. We want to make sure that we don't uh, lose any data. Now, um, the next time we're gonna see in more detail how we can uh, use this decomposition method in order to get to one of those uh, normal forms with a principled uh, method. Now um, we have very few uh, minutes uh, left, so I can take a few questions on some uh, older material. I think I had uh, one at the very beginning. It was about um, when we uh, release the logs of a transaction and uh, how that uh, relates to the uh, commit time. So here the important point is that after you release the logs and before you commit, you cannot allow any other transactions to uh, grab logs on those objects on which you have just uh, released the logs if you want to be strict. Because um, the nice property of a strict two-phase locking is that we avoid those cascading aborts, which can happen if a transaction releases the lock on an object early, then another transaction comes along and grabs a lock on that object and reads the current value. Then the first transaction decides to abort. At that point, it would also cause the second transaction to abort. 
So in order to avoid that, you want to make sure that it, between the transaction releases the log and uh, commits or abort. You cannot have any other transactions snatching the log uh, in between. So you want to get those two uh, close together. Yes, exactly. And for snapshot uh, isolation, you abort if there is a conflicting rights uh, on the same uh, object. Exactly. And uh, for the reading, um, all the transactions start from the from a certain snapshot, which uh, doesn't uh, change during the execution of the transaction. Sure. Any other questions on today's material or also, allowing some questions on previous material. Any questions on lossy versus non lossy recomposition? Okay, seems that uh, most questions uh, were answered. Um, all right, then uh, the next time we're gonna see how we can uh, get to some of those normal forms that we have outlined uh, by using uh, decomposition. We're also gonna make uh, uh, an end-to-end -end example for a database design. And then we are gonna start with uh, new topics where we essentially uh, look at systems that uh, go away from those uh, very traditional relational database management systems that we have so far been discussing. Have a nice day, and then I see you again on Friday.